Good afternoon. Good morning, everybody, uh, depending on where you are in the world today. Um, thank you for joining our panel discussion regarding continuation funds and co-investment structures. Uh, today we'll be having a very timely discussion, given that although we are currently in a very challenging period for VC and PE markets, we're seeing a continued high volume of secondary transactions, and in particular, uh, GP or sponsor-led secondary transactions. Uh, the, the numerous geopolitical, geopolitical risks, uh, global financial uncertainty, lowering evaluations are all making traditional problems more difficult for fund managers than they usually are. These are common problems that we all experience, such as timing exits to provide liquidity to investors and investing new capital into well-performing portfolio companies. Today, we will discuss how continuation funds can be a potential solution in such a market uh, to provide liquidity to investors looking to exit while at the same time extending the runway of best performing portfolio companies for new investors and those investors of the original fund that want to roll into the continuation fund. Uh, another challenging situation that uh, we face as fund ma managers is when you have the right through your right of first refusal or otherwise to purchase additional secondary shares of a well-performing uh, portfolio company. But either because your investment guidelines said that you've maxed out your percentage allocation to a specific uh, portfolio company, or perhaps the fund is fully deployed, you are unable to do this, make this additional add-on investment. That's where the co-investment structure comes in to solve this problem, which can be open to the existing LPs of your fund and new investors, and giving people targeted exposure to well-performing companies. All in all, and I should point out, I did a little research this morning, According to Jeffries, the global secondary volumes was approximately 108 billion in 2022, making it the second biggest ever since 2021, which was 132 billion of secondary transactions. And the GP led volumes in 2022 was approximately 52 billion, despite the challenging market, market conditions. Continuation funds and co-investment structures are you know, key drivers for this high volume and we'd be very much amiss not to be highlighting it um, in a panel such as today. Uh, at Flashpoint, from the VC perspective, we're always trying to find ways, uh, search for ways to provide liquidity to our investors, which of course we hope will be reinvested in our new products through exits and provide liquidity to our well-performing companies. Today, we're very lucky to have a strong panel to take us through these various issues uh, from several viewpoints, that of the legal advisor, the investor, uh, perhaps the uh, advisor to the fund, and maybe a bit of words from the benefits to the portfolio company. Just in terms of the format for today, um, we'll be giving each of our speakers a bit of time to walk us through the topics they deem most relevant, and then we'll have some panel discussion. At the end, following the last speaker, we will take questions from the audience. Now, please let me let, uh, briefly introduce the panel that we have today. Uh, first, we have Nicholas, who has spent 25 years in institutional capital raising. He started his career at Oak Bridge Capital, where he was in charge of international business development, investor relations. And during his tenure, Oak Tree's AUM moved from 15 billion to 70 billion. Uh, he left Oak Tree and ultimately established New End, a global advisory fund, which focuses on many things that are relevant for today. Uh, strategic GP advisory, primary fundraising, direct investments, uh, both sponsor-led co-investments and secondaries, LP and GP, and various general partner capital solutions. As I'm sure he will note, he's currently working on a number uh, or getting to work, bring to market a number of transactions across these areas. We also have Nick Benson uh, as a senior partner in the investment <coughs> funds practice at Latham & Watkins. He advises sponsors and investors on fund formation and on many secondary transactions. He's been a specialist for 25 years and has extensive experience, which we can attest to at Flashpoint, of helping his clients uh, work through up good markets, bad markets, and selecting the right uh, structures and jurisdictions in which to launch uh, new products. We're very happy to say that Nick is our go-to expert in the world of funds. We also have Tim Reed. Uh, Tim has over 30 years of experience in private equity advisory, investment banking, and law in a number of global leading firms. Um, he's led a large number of industry leading private equity fundraisings, corporate finance transactions and debt restructurings. He founded TMR Strategic in 2009, and his firm provides strategic advice to private equity firms on all sources of structures for capital raising and focuses on emerging, marge, emerging managers, um, including those that look for deal by deal, deal fundraising and also uh, continuation vehicles and mini funds. 
Finally, me, uh, Stephen Polakoff, your moderator. I'm a partner and general counsel at uh, Flashpoint. Flashpoint is an international tech investment manager focused on international tech companies originating in Europe and Israel, but active with revenue globally. Uh, we manage six venture funds with about $450 million of AUM, covering VC funds, venture debt funds, and a secondary fund. And we're in London, also New York, Tel Aviv, Budapest, Warsaw, Riga, and Nicosia. I myself have been practicing for about 25 years, uh, working for a variety of leading law firms, investment banks, corporates, and funds. Now, with great pleasure, I would like to give the floor to Tim, uh, who I think will enter this discussion about the rationale for pursuing continuation funds, and perhaps uh, a little bit of a backdrop as to what's happening in the secondary markets generally. Uh, Tim, over to you. Thanks, thanks very much, Stephen. <clears throat> Look, I, I also think it's a very interesting time to be having this sort of discussion. And funnily enough, I'd looked at the same statistic that uh, you did this morning. And uh, yeah, look, almost surprising to see just how far continuation vehicles, GP LEDs have come, you know, as you say, making up uh, making up 50% of the of the secondaries market. And that's a secondaries market that is, as we all know, has grown massively, particularly over the, over the last uh, few years. Um, if you sort of think about where these types of transactions come from, you know, the, the sort of basic rationale, um, you know, most, most of these transactions, or the rationale for most of these transactions were, was that funds were coming to the end of their, their, their life. Maybe it, uh, it wasn't the best time, it wasn't the best environment to sell that asset, uh, or, or the GP just felt it sort of had a wee rate way to run. And these vehicles made a, a lot of sense. They, um, they, they solved the solution of end of fun life. They, they gave people liquidity, but they also gave investors the opportunity to roll into an asset that they knew very well. Well, the, the, the market has changed sort of quite a, a lot uh, since then. And I have to say, I have seen um, some of these vehicles where I've wondered if it was just co-invest with another name. I think the line, the line has, has got very close. But, um, you, you know, what, what, what's, what's the reason that people are, um, are adopting these types of structures at the moment? Well, it's been a pretty limited uh, M&A market. Um, it has been helpful <coughs> to provide uh, liquidity. Uh, there is a lot of the secondary money out there. So if you are looking at uh, whether to go to your existing or potential new for co-invest or continuation vehicle, continuation vehicles have been quite attractive because of the quantity of capital, um, but also because often they offer uh, more attractive terms than co-invest. There's been the expectation, particularly on larger funds, that uh, co-invest should attract little or, or, or no economics. It's been very different with, with continuation funds. Um, and yeah, look for, for GPs raising a fund where they're going to people and um, an awful phrase, but you know, investors always want some more juice. Um, you know, it's been quite useful to have some of these uh, crown jewels in the portfolio. Um, that uh, have a clear next step in their evolution and can be rolled, or one or more assets can be rolled into a continuation vehicle <clears throat> alongside fundraising, both giving your existing liquidity, but also um, offering um, an attractive side proposition for, uh, for, for other investors. Um, for, for LPs, um, uh, you, you know, what, what, what does it offer them? It, it, it offers them the potential to invest with a manager that, uh, that they'll uh, often either be invested in or have tracked for some time or, or trust in an asset that they've uh, seen that manager uh, manage for, for some time. So, you know, in, in theory, this offers um, LPs an opportunity to invest in an attractive uh, asset uh, with uh, you, you know att attractive risk re weighted returns at lower economics than they would um, 
than they would be paying in, if they were investing in a, in a primary. And, and, and given the, the, you know, the types of returns that we've seen from secondary funds and the amount of money that's going into that market, it seems for the moment anyway that that, uh, that, that overall strategy is, is, is proving true. I think in terms of, and you know, what, what are we seeing currently? I think, look, we, we've, um, I've seen more pushback from LPs on uh, continuation uh, vehicles more recently. I mean, there was there were just too too many in the market, and um, I, I think in terms of the change that that I've seen, I mean, this should all have always been important, but it's becoming more and more important for GPs to to show a clear rationale for the for their transaction. Um, you know, what is the business plan? Uh, for for that business in the in the new vehicle, um, why are they the natural owner or, or manager? Sorry, of that business in the new vehicle, you know what are the return <coughs> expectations? You know, it it uh, and will this be a, a distraction? Has this asset got too large for this strategy? Will it just become a, a distraction for the for the main business? So. Um, yeah, look, I think it's been a great run, but I think for a lot of managers, they need to go back to, to fundamentals when they're considering, you know, these types of structures and uh, whether when an exit uh, option is available, that's the better route. There is a better manager of that, that asset going forward um, or is it more appropriate for co-invest? I guess the, the driving focus is the deal itself. Uh, don't try to dress it up in the structure or try to have it fit into some, um, you know, some shape that you think is marketable today, but actually the deal should speak for itself. And then, and then the structure is just a, you know, a natural next step. Yeah. And look, because the temptations are there, you know, you can continue to, to draw an albeit lower percentage management fee, but on a much higher base and crystallize carry, although often you'll, uh, uh, the LPs will require you to roll it into the new transaction, but also earn a nice carry stream going forward. It can help with fundraising, as I've said. So there are clear attractions there, but I think that's more reason than any uh, to show a very clear rationale, as I say, for, as you say, for the transaction, um, rather than it just being a, a, a convenient structure. Sorry, Stephen, I think you're on yeah, mute. Yeah, you, you, you're on mute, yeah. <clears throat> Apologies, everybody, technology. Um, thanks for that. Uh, it's a great way to, to, to really set up the discussion to talk about the rationale as to why people are, are choosing these products. And I think, uh, Nicholas, you may be able to give some insight as to you know how we've gotten here and how these structures have evolved and maybe some of the developments in this space in the last few years and, and talk about how you know, what, what LPs are looking for. Thank you. I think I'll take a few step backs because you made me think about the past 20 years and how <laughs> LPs and conversely sponsors have been using the concept of continuation funds, uh, co-investments and what have you. I'll take a step back first to talk about the definitions and secondly about basically a matter of supply and demand <clears throat> against a single backdrop this conversation is happening because the primary fund market is closed. If the primary fund markets were working as they did, it, let's say mid 2010s, we would not have this conversation. Just very simple. Continuations and co-investment vehicles have are the brainchild of a very difficult market and are somewhat seen from the GP's perspective as the only way to a be able to keep on growing AUM and the only way to be able to reach the sacred DPI above one. It is not something they do, uh, you know, with a smile on their face. I recall the early 2000s when at Oak Tree we were raising funds and it was really the beginning of the demand side of LPs asking us, could we do some co-investments? Very few LPs were looking for co-investments and Sponsors a la Oak Tree were making promises, never written, but those promises were never delivered because at the end, LPs never asked for these co-investments because they didn't have the bandwidth nor the teams to monitor them. It was just 
the beginning of a sense that something was happening there. So when you when you graph the demand supply over 20 years, let's say to early 2005 and what have you, demand for co-investments were quasi nil from an LP perspective. They peaked, I would say, around 2018, when they were essentially seen as a means to lower the overall fee structure when they were when xyz was committing to a fund similarly the supply from gps was nil in the early 2005 it was not considered as necessary to throw in co-investments and the supply from gps is peaking now this is a the only way gps are actually capable of actually deploying capital and keeping their standing in the market vis-a-vis -vis advisors vis-a-vis -vis uh industry networks and what have you so it's very interesting to graph both and to see that basically i'll come back to the to, to a few of the other step backs i want to take is that the demand from lps went from zero in 2005 peak in 2015 18 when the supply from gps was not yet there and today i would argue the demand from lps has cratered they have they they has they still haven't beefed up their teams or put the carry or compensation structures in place to be able to actually deal with uh, co-investments the right way or without feeling that they're being shown not necessarily the best deals, but deals will need to be taken out of the fund so DPIs can stay above a certain level. And similarly, the supply from GPs, as I said, non-existence while the times were good. You did not need to provide uh, co-investments, the only people you provide co-investment with, and I believe everyone in the industry is borrowing from their songbook, is the Canadian pension plans. If you go back to the early 2000s, Canadian pension plans were steady eddy, primary LPs, big tickets, global, because their local market was not big enough. So any GP, whether he was Asian, European, or, or American, US, was going to Canada because it was open field. What happened... Five, five years later, the Canadian uh, sponsor, LPs, excuse me, they pioneered most of the stuff we're currently speaking about. They pioneered continuation fund, they pioneered secondary investment, they pioneered sponsor-led co-investments, they pioneered NAV financing. All these, effort, cap, all these different capital solutions were essentially put in place by these massive funds who today, you know, five, 2010, Canadians knock on Oak Tree or others door saying, oh, could we do some co-investment with you guys? And 2015, they said, well, could we co-invest with you? In other words, you buy 100 million, we buy 100 million, and we do it together. And palm, what happens in 2020? You have sealed envelopes, Oak Tree making a bid, CDPQ making a bid. They become competitors. And I think, you know, it's an open market there. And many, many LPs have figured out that, hmm, that's an interesting way to allocate capital to primary, to alternatives. And therefore, what we see today is that LPs are no longer putting 100% of their capital through a GPLP primary model, but are from a family office doing no more funds to an institution doing, you know, 50-50. We basically are today now in a market where I would say on average, 60% of alternative capital is still funneled through a primary fund format. And the balance is, is, is funneled through the formats I'm going to now define to you. And before doing that, uh, there's another element which is super important to understand the, you know, the mechanics around continuations and co-investments is what do we put under the label of sponsor? Sponsor are three things. Operating partners, what I call the dirty little secret of the private equity industry. Private equity shops are quite light in terms of personnel but they, they their main job is to find teams who are industry specialists sector specialists country specialists and and finance them today what we are seeing is that operating partners who've been running millions and billions for in, on behalf of large private equity shops or real estate shops one who's sort of free the, from the shackles of these guys and what they do they come to see guys like us and say well instead of being only working on behalf of xyz why don't you put us in touch with, I don't, I'm inventing here, Texas teacher, CDPQ, or the family office, or I don't know, Ford, <laughs> random names. And this is one thing where the use of continuation vehicles and co-investment structures is spreading. That's item number one. So it's the, 
it's the operating partners freeing themselves from a bilateral relationship with a, with a GP. The second one is the fundless sponsor. The fundless sponsor is by definition someone who will never raise a fund. It's quite interesting to see the difference between Europe and, and the US. In the US, being a fundless sponsor is almost a badge of, hmm, we failed. We don't have a fund, therefore we are fundless, or what the Americans call an independent sponsor. And they almost see it as a one step before having a fund. In Europe, maybe because people are older or wiser, whatever it is, there are a lot of very good teams who never will go and raise a fund. They're very happy to do a deal per deal, a thematic platform or what have you. And therefore for them, doing co-investments co on continuations makes a lot of sense. And last is, the, is, the, is the, your classic GP who has now is reading the market. And the market is that we don't want to re-up in fund eight or nine of what you are doing because your DPIs are not there. And therefore what they are led to do is to come up with solutions around what, I, what we call internally directs. And that moves me to the other side of the, of the equation, which is what are today LPC? They are seeing three things coming their way. They are seeing sponsor-led co-investments, which are coming either pre-exclusivity, under exclusivity, or under syndication model. These are primary capital fundraisers. These are the toughest. These are the ones where you are asking an LP to take the maximum risk because the success of a direct deal, which I would label as a secondary, is very simple, two words, information bias. The information bias is that you have owned, are still owning, and plan on owning the company further. So that means you know what's happening. You know what the reporting looks like. You know how the people behave and you know what the hurdles and obstacles are. A pure single asset primary co-investment, it's maximum risk. And I believe today LPs are not ready to do that. Best case scenario, they will do a platform co-investment in, you know, solution where they will buy into a concept. I'm inventing a buy and build in the car washing space or whatever of that, but very specific where you actually have a really ident identified theme. But it, even there, it's becoming quite challenging. So that's the first uh, vertical you have under the header we have for this, for this call here today. The second one is the continuation. Continuation is exactly, that's the sweet spot. This is the information bias at its best. And continuation essentially is a secondary primary combo where the GP is smiling because he can essentially show DPI, sometimes get carry, and also please some of his longstanding LPs who want to see who want to see cash. None of the three reasons, by the way, are sufficient enough for a new investor to come in. This is all good for the one who is leaving the table or for the or for the sponsor who's taking money out of the table. The newcomer, what's in it for him? Well, what's in it for him is that information bias again. He's going to ask the sponsor or the GP to put back 70 to 100 percent of the carry into the deal. And yes, he's going into something which in some ways is de-risked, probably less return, but de-risked. And in current environment, it's not a bad place to be. And then there is the, well, the third vertical, I would call is the pure secondary where really and people are using all kinds of fancy words of a sleeve, a strip, or whatever the, the, the wording is. And there, I think we are almost into financial engineering, where at the end of the day, you don't actually know really what you've bought. You've bought something which is mimicking a fund, but happens to be priced at a so-called price discovery arm's length level, but you don't really know. So I'm, I'm just you know, flagging here that the under the name of co-investments, there's a lot of things floating. And at the end, it's really what, what my suggestion for investors is look at where the sponsor, where is he in his primary fundraising? Is he actually looking to raise capital as a primary fund manager? Is he really good in that, in that space and has a grand vision about how he can scale up that space? All these elements before you even look at the deal are key to actually going into such a transaction. But the, and then brings the, the fourth layer, which is the what I would call the multi-asset uh, 
continuation fund or the, or the multi-asset co-investment. Multi-asset co-investment is a bit of a dodgy concept. It's really more sort of a platform build-up. You can you can think about it, but multi-asset co-investment is is doesn't exist. You have, you know you can't just put together a list of things you want to buy with, if there's no sort of common thread to all of them. So I'd be I'd be a bit careful there. But anyway, I just wanted to say that. The market we are today, from, if you look at it from an investor, and we speak to investors all day long and have a variety, I'm not talking about us here, but a variety of options, how to have them deploy capital from real estate to infra to whatever, they see a, a, a wave of sponsor-led co-investments coming their way. Most of them are when the, it's a, in the fuzzy space, or so, oh, we are exclusive, but we are missing 100 million to put and some to, to put into that deal. We're going to put some or oh, 10 million from our fund and 90 million coming up. It it becomes very sort of what's going on here. And I would say that one has to be very clear and be very outspoken. I mean about the fact that we are all collectively. This industry is all going all the way in continuations and secondaries and and co investments because the primary market is shut. The moment the primary market reopens, I can bet you that this, you know, piece of our business environment will collapse. I'll stop on that high note. Yeah, Nicholas, just one, one question from my side. In terms of what your uh, what the LPs are looking for, do you see a preference to a continuation fund that has yes. multiple Info assets or a single asset? Information bias is key. You know, it's at any given time it's 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 fuzzy what's happening and you the forward looking environment so if you can have something on which you can hold to i think it's information bias if you have information bias and on top of that you have a willing seller listen i'm coming from i mean 15 years or whatever at oak tree leaves the distressed investor mindset in my mind is that if you have a forced seller and by forced seller i mean a gp who needs to who needs to show DPI to please his teams, to be able to raise his next fund and to have LPs even thinking about a re-up, that's a soft definition of distressed seller. So if you can have the mix of information bias, a willing seller, some LPs will re-up in that continuation, you have a very good mix of things. And not only that, but you have a unicity of theme around the assets going into that multi-asset continuation you have something which which can stand on its two 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 feet. If you have something which is a hodgepodge of consumer goods, uh, SaaS, and what have you, huh? You're just literally just creating something where you kind of already have baked the fact that it's going to be not so good a contraption. So I, I wish I had a one size fits all answer. I can just tell you that today, you know, you have the one extreme which is Canadian pension plans who've gone all the way. And who see their offer to do co-investment as a way, as a no-nonsense way to to be involved in the market without paying any fees, to now a whole industry. And Tim was referring to that. There's a whole industry which has been created around co-investments, uh, and the, you just have to look at a at a French private equity firm. I won't mention their name here. Who literally just announced that you know they've been doing private equity funds for the better of 20 years. They own their fund eight, and they just launched a co-investment fund. Why do they do that? I suspect that, well, they probably won't be able to buy into their own continuations, but they, what they are seeing in the market is a burst of, con of co co-investment or continuation opportunities. And therefore, well, they think it's a good way also to deploy capital. Is it a peak of market when everybody comes out with a continuation, they, uh, with a co-investment fund? That's my opinion. Can, can I just make one very brief comment on that? Because I agree, it's really interesting looking back over the last 20 or so years and, you know, seeing, seeing how the, this, this whole evolution has changed. And one of, the, one, one of the interesting points that you've sort of touched on this, Nicholas, in terms of fees, is that we haven't really seen a massive change to the, 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 the basic, basic economics of a, of, a, of a primary fund. Um, yeah. But underlying all of that, we have seen a massive change in the blended economics that large... Uh, investors are getting. So I think there will always be the need or, or in the near future, there will be the need for um, GPs to create these opportunities if for no other reason but for their fundraising. And I guess that's mm -hmm. part of the danger in all of this. 
And before the, the the core investments used to happen before in the in the in a very simple way. If you remember five six years ago, people were moaning about the fact that private equity funds were selling assets to other private equity funds. We're pretty much in the same situation, except that the new buyer is no longer the other private equity funds because they don't have the money. It's a consortium of LPs put together by some sponsor. So you know, or the main the same sponsor actually. So it's you know it's kind of we're going full circle quite a few times here. Interesting. Um, I think it's also really important to get a, a quick sense, uh, Let uh, give the floor to Nick Benson to maybe just talk a little bit about what does it actually mean structurally? What What is a co-investment? Uh, what is an LP getting himself into or herself into versus uh, the structure around a continuation fund? And what are some of the issues that come up that people should be looking out for from a legal or corporate governance perspective? Uh, Nick, I think you're on mute now. Your stage is Nick's, not mine, not me. Nick, can you, uh, we yeah, lost Nick. I, yeah, I think he's going to reconnect. Okay. I mean, um, but coming back to the question, I'd be curious, uh, Nick, please. Nope. Still mute. Uh, no volume. Now you're muted. Um, unmute one more time. There we go, Nick. Here you are. Great. Okay. Apologies uh, for the technological issues. Um, yeah, I was going to start off just by uh, echoing what we've heard just now from from Nicholas and from Tim. Really, that over the the past few years, from a, a legal perspective, um, the the growth of this market and the immense variety both in the the structures uh the terms and the nature of these transactions how they're executed as as just um exponentially increased so i'm going to caveat what i say um in terms of describing some of the typical issues and features that come up by the fact that uh, there is really no one size fits all just to to coin a phrase in in the legal uh, viewpoint as well as the commercial viewpoint here. So, um, I mean, structurally, I, I suppose, you know, from the outside, a, a continuation fund uh, looks very much like any other fund. Um, you typically will have a limited partnership or perhaps more than one, depending on the, the structural requirements. Uh, the, so the vehicle uh, will typically replicate the vehicle that is the selling fund because the sponsor will naturally want to to leverage off the the same structure and, and infrastructure that they have there and of, and also because their existing investors are more likely to be comfortable with something that's familiar to them so we we often see very uh, a continuation fund based on the same documentation and structure that uh, the selling fund has uh, but there are some very important differences as well um obviously the key one is that 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 with a continuation vehicle essentially you're buying into a uh, either one asset or a bunch of assets that's already uh identified and and well known uh, at least to the, the the lps who are already in the selling fund uh from a the 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 buyer perspective, i.e., the, the secondaries players that are coming in and and, and sit, sort of leading the the the, the um, transactions on the buy side, obviously they're they're treating it very much like an M and A transaction in a lot of respects. So there's a sort of crossover in, in a continuation vehicle transaction between a, a primary fundraising and an M and A transaction, and that feeds into both the process and the documentation and the the terms that are negotiated. Um, so, so obviously, with, with a, a, a mature portfolio of assets, um, the the the, the continu continuation vehicle is going to be capitalised largely up front with with uh, a, a percentage of unfunded capital there for follow-ons and expenses. Um, uh, but 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 in other respects, and we can come on to the economics uh, as well because that's a key difference. Um, in a lot of other respects, the the the, the terms are, are quite similar to to a primary fund, but on the economics, that is really, 
I would say the key differential uh, from a legal perspective um, where you've got a management fee that's based uh, not on committed but on invested capital you've usually got a a, a a more complicated distribution waterfall compared to the the waterfalls that we see in a primary fund so as opposed to a simple eight percent preferred return hurdle and then an 80 20 carry split we may well be looking at a a, a both a, a, a dual uh, hurdle test comprising both uh, IRR and multiple uh, thresholds and also several different tiers of carry. So you might start off with a 10% carry with a certain IRR and multiple being achieved and then that ratchets up as the, uh, as the hurdle gets higher. So there's the, the, the different economics in there are, are, are are pretty critical, but also the fact that within the continuation fund, um, whilst those economics uh, will apply to the, the 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 investors that are buying in as essentially secondaries investors, the the the, the investors who are rolling in to that vehicle from the selling fund will often have a very different set of economics um, because. Uh, the GP wants to effectively present them with the the status quo, as we generally refer to it. In other words, by continuing their participation in those assets, their economics are not going to change compared to the economics they currently enjoy in the selling fund. So that may mean that if we're at the end of the life of the selling fund, there's no further management fee being charged, then they will be not they will not be paying a fee in the continuation fund either. And also their carry may well be aggregated with the carry that they're paying in the selling fund, which then creates a conflict of interest for the GP because you've got two groups of investors in the continuation vehicle with, with, who, whose economics are fundamentally different. And therefore you can, you know your decisions on how you manage the assets in that vehicle uh, can be driven uh, or can, there can be a tension between the drivers of of how you manage the assets because you're getting you may be getting carry on one category of investor but not on another um so that that is a it it, it is always a source of uh, um conflict of interest and and, and one that the advisors need to take very seriously in order to get the transaction through the various approvals that are required. Um, yeah, Nick, I think along those lines, I, I, another area of conflict potentially is setting the price at which the yes. assets are being transferred into the new vehicle, because there you clearly have one side looking for the lowest price and one side looking for the highest price, depending on if you're rolling or you're exiting and then, and, or if you're new. Yeah, exactly. And this is, this is maybe the most fundamental conflict really is that you, the GP is both buyer and seller in these transactions. And whereas from a, a selling perspective, obviously the GP is motivated to get a, a, a good price provided of course, that the selling fund is already in the carry or is, is, is has the p potential to, to make carry as a result of this transaction. Obviously, if that's not the case, then uh, there's a, that's a key uh, motivational factor that's going to be missing from the, the sell side incentive, uh, whereas on the the buy side, obviously the GP want is motivated to to get um, uh, the, the the purchase price down because then that lowers the the hurdle at which uh, carry gets paid on the continuation vehicle. So um, the 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 market has has sort of developed a a number of, of practices to uh, address these conflicts. Um, but primarily, uh, the requirement um, to obtain an independent fairness opinion, which essentially looks at the way the pricing was arrived at and provides a confirmation that in the view of the, the, the firm providing that opinion, that the process was fair and that the price is within the range of, of what you might call market pricing for those assets, taking into account all the relevant factors. 
Um, and then also you're looking at the the actual sale process itself. You know, were the did the GP engage appropriately with the market in terms of using a a professional secondaries advisor to go out there and 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 do the proper price discovery, get the the buyers engaged, get 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 an auction process going, so that at the end of that process there's a demonstrable uh, p amount of, of work and effort that has gone into finding the, the, the best price, as it were, in quotes, available in the market at this time for what's being sold. And then finally, the requirement to have the whole thing blessed by the advisory board of the selling fund, uh, which is, uh, is to an extent going to be reliant on the first two components uh, i mean i don't think you would want to approach an advisory board without having gone through those robust processes because the the advisory board is very mindful of the conflict and is not going to sign off on anything unless they are comfortable that the gp has followed best practice in that regard um, and interestingly um, as the the market has evolved over the last few years. We are seeing some attempts by uh, fund sponsors to, to build into their primary fund documentation some uh, uh, provisions concerning the process of a continuation vehicle and, and in particular the way that the advisory board will be engaged uh and and the consents that will be required or or in some cases will not be required because the uh the gps are essentially trying to pre get pre-consent by building these provisions into their lpa so there's a source of tension there and obviously lps are looking at that and thinking well hang on a minute in 10 years time we don't know what you're going to be doing what the situation is going to be so we don't really want to be signing away our ability to review and scrutinize and approve these transactions down the line. And then also you've got regulators looking at these provisions now as well, in particular, the SEC um, wanting to ensure that GPs are not being too fast and loose with, with uh, the way they, they build these provisions into their, their fund documentation. Um, so the, yes, that's the, there are a multitude of other conflicts which we could spend all afternoon talking about, and and the the level of disclosures that uh, we see now in continuation vehicle documentation, the explanatory memorandum about how conflicts are, are addressed, and the risk factors are, are a testament to to the the level of complexity and 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 the conflicts issues that have to be navigated on these transactions so um, it, it's definitely an area where there has been and will continue to be um, the potential for uh, making serious mistakes if you if you're not sufficiently focused either from a, a gp or an lp perspective on on issues around conflicts of interest so I'll stop there because I'm conscious we're we're sort of uh, yeah. running running up through the time. So uh, hand back to you, Stephen. Yeah, thank you, Nick. And maybe one question for Nicholas or Tim: um, To what extent, when the process gets going and discussions regarding you know, the ultimate you know sale price of the asset to the continuation fund starts to crystallize, do the investors in the new fund start to get very concerned about how many people are rolling into the new fund and how many people are cashing out? And has that actually, in the end, if there are too many people are looking to exit and not to roll, has it actually spooked the new investors in going forward with the deal? Tim, if you want. Uh, look, I, it, if all look, y y yes, it, it's a question, but um, look, I think there are sort of more fundamental questions than um, that new investors are, are concerned with about, you know, the things we touched on before, motivation obviously pricing uh, timing uh, which LPs are who, who the existing group is you know what their view on on thing is but th things are but I think <clears throat> by the time you get to to that you, you know I, I think the starting is obviously do they like the asset and do they like the manager and I generally find as you get into the, the these processes by the time you're talking um, about the sorts of issues about the percentages of, of 
people rolling over and who might be in and who might be out, unless there's just unless it's just an anomalous transaction. I don't think you're going to see a massive fallout over those sorts of issues at that point in the in, in the transaction. I, I just would add that there's no one answer. Clearly, the the sponsor's behavior and risk on risk off uh, feature going forward is the key element. Besides the asset, of course, or the sector, and you know, asset sector, multi asset, single asset are key elements. But after that one, which is sort of a easy criteria to sort of do a selection is what does what is the sponsor going to be doing and in what environment is he actually evolving is it a make or break deal for them to then be in a position to raise their next fund is it just a way to uh, you know manage a group of restless lieutenants in the firm who need who still you know haven't got carry on the fund because the fund is doing is doing poorly and you you put some of the carry on the on the on these elements of the team who need to be kept. There's a lot of elements which are really relevant to the at the sponsor level. I would say the whether LPs or not are rolling over or leaving. Each LP has such a such a variety of reasons. Whether it's reallocation, whether it's under the US LP deciding to cut off his exposure to Europe or to USD or to Euro, or there's so many elements there, or just a contraction of his allocation to PE or to real estate. I don't think the LP's position is so much of a, of a matter for, for new LPs coming in. Most new LPs coming in are somewhat co-investment professionals. As I said earlier, there's this whole industry which has propped up in the past year. So in some ways, well, LPs are selling the, in, and they see it as an opportunity. I mean, remember, most of the money is done at the, at the, at the selling price. You know, like any good PE deal, you, you, it's, a, it's when you buy that you do, you know, 60 i shouldn't say that but you do 60 percent of your return is when you buy it is interesting though you know L lps coming into a deal will say you know we're never followers but but what's it what, what is everyone else doing yeah but uh you know and then and, and as, as as nick said every deal or every sponsor and every yeah. I would say structure is different comes with its own sets of uh pain points or sensitivity so there's no one blanket uh, grid. I mean, we usually always try to have a grid internally or what such and we, we see 10, 15 deals a week. So is there, is there a screening method? Is there a way to do it? Well, there really isn't because one, one week healthcare is what everybody wants to do. The other one is, is elderly care or the other week is pet, uh, care. The other week is, and it's, it changes all the time. And, you know, it's, so you, you know, you, you use your common sense. And I think the quality of the sponsor is probably the key, the key feature. And yeah, I used to laugh about the fact that people said, oh, I won't do a co-investment or continuation because I don't know the GP. And I sort of say, well, you know, how when 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 will you actually know him? Sort of the chicken, the famous chicken and egg. But the reality is there's some truth to it. You know, the best deals are done with GPs who you've seen in action, including in low points. And when that, and I think know. also GPs that give you some access uh, that are more reachable. I think in, in these types of transactions, it's important to have a dialogue with your GP and not yeah, be, but, you know. But again, the moment the primary fund market reopens and becomes what it was, this access, this sort of rubbing shoulders next to between LP GP, it will disappear. I can I can bet you anything that this sort of golden period we have today between LPs and GPs, we will see a reversal. Well, while we're, we've opened up uh, for some questions, uh, waiting to see if any come in, I guess maybe the uh, a sort of gambling question, um, where do you think the uh, AUM of uh, secondary transactions will be for 2024? Are we going to be going down or are we, are we peaked or is anybody have a, a want to make a risky guess? I'm, I'm happy to jump in. I would distinguish between infra real estate, private equity and 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 Credit. I think private equity has peaked. We're talking. Con we're talking. What secondaries are we talking? GP-led secondaries, aka continuations. Well, the, the full the full market of, of secondaries, well, and then a subset being the the, the GP-led. Correct. Co co Sponsor-led co-investments will go on forever. Funds are going to get smaller, so people will need additional capital to invest alongside their funds correct. to do deals. So that will go on forever as long as the primary market is 
more or less shut. Pure secondary, GP-led continuation or equivalent, we're going to see an explosion in credit. You know, we need raw material. The raw material has been now beefing up and growing up in the past five years on the private credit side of things. Private credit has been a footnote in the secondary market for the past 10 years, if not non-existent. This, the, the raw material is piling up and the golden age for credit secondaries is ahead of us. Credit sec private equity secondaries, I think there's so many funds being raised. And I mean, you all know that or have seen it or the statistics are not necessarily shown around, but private equity secondaries today, again, trading at par. Huh. You know, yes, you, you mitigate the J curve. You have access to fully fledged portfolios, but you know, it's gonna, it's, it's tough. And credit is far from trading at par. And you have then the best pace. I mean, sorry, Stephen, you'll, you'll, you'll sympathize there is that Secondaries on the VC and growth. You you buy you can buy portfolio of, of VC funds 60 cents on the dollar. So but the raw material is not that massive, so it will the, that opportunity Correct. will shut down. I'll stop talking mostly. Okay. Uh, so Tim, Nick, any thoughts? So my, my, my very simple bit, I mean the secondary market, you, you know, the overall secondary market, I think, will continue to to grow as as we've seen the momentum still think seems to be there. In the GP leads continuation vehicles. I think um, the headline numbers may not change, but number of deals will go down. So I think um, I, I already get the sense that a number of the LPs are sort of getting a bit bored of some of the smaller uh, transactions, especially where they're uh, seen to, to be launching pads for funds. Yeah, great. And Nick, uh, what are you seeing from your client inflow? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I... I, I think the I mean what we've seen in the past with with uh, these uh, sort of trends is that they tend to kind of start in the the sort of buyout markets and then uh, when when the sort of concepts have been uh, sufficiently proven uh, in in the, that that area then they kind of the players then start to look at all these other asset classes you know and we mentioned just now private credit and and then there's all you know infrastructure venture um yeah I, I, so i think we'll see more and more focused um approaches so rather than and, and on the fundraising side you know rather than just raising a a fund that does secondaries full stop it will be funds that do venture secondaries uh also you know the same range of of strategies and and uh different different focuses that we see in the primary fundraising market yep just uh, listen i i no other questions have come through um i'd like to thank all the panel members for your time today and it, it i'd be curious to see what we say about this next year maybe we'll have a uh, a refresh in 12 months time and see what our predictions look like and where we thought the trends were heading. And for those of you in the audience, uh, thank you for sitting with us for almost an hour at this point. And feel free to reach out um, uh, through LinkedIn to me or to one of the other members of, of the panel with any questions or follow-up that you have. We'd be happy to uh, continue the dialogue offline. Thank you, everybody. Thanks very much, Stephen. Thanks. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye.